All right. We have a lot of people joining us, and it's just a few minutes after 1030, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you to all of you taking time out of your busy days. I know your time is really valuable, and everyone has lots going on right now, so we really, really appreciate you joining us for this valuable hour um, with uh, Dr. James Peck and UCLA ISAP. Um, today's topic is an overview of screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment approaches for adolescents. And the shorthand for that is SBIRT. We'll hear more about that in just a minute. Um, CSHA is honored to co-present this webinar with the California Alliance and the California School Nurses Organization. Um, we really uh, want to give a big thank you to our funders for this project and all of our substance use work um, over the last couple of years, the Youth Opioid Response California Project, which is funded by the California Department of Healthcare Services. So thank you so much to them for making this work possible. I am Amy Ranger. I'm the Director of Programs at the California School-Based Health Alliance, and our presenter today is Dr. James Peck, Senior Clinical Trainer at the UCLA Integrated Substance Use Abuse Programs. Um, I will tell you a little bit about him. He's a licensed clinical psychologist and the senior clinical trainer. Uh, for nearly a decade, Dr. Peck conducted phase two clinical trials of behavioral and pharmacological interventions for stimulant dependence. Dr. Peck has extensive experience conducting curriculum development, clinical trainings, and clinical supervision on the etiology, assessment, and treatment of substance-related disorders, and on the treatment of individuals with co-occurring substance-related and psychiatric disorders. He currently works at UCLA in a primarily clinical training role and maintains a busy practice treating individuals with co-occurring co disorders. Um, quick housekeeping, uh, this presentation is being recorded and we will be sharing the slides and the recording uh, right away. Um, we will also um, send out lots of other additional information in an email and the, evalu and the evaluation link at the end of this presentation. Um, there's not a lot of time for questions, um, but Dr. Peck will see if he can um, carve out a few minutes at the end. Um, you can either save them or if you wanna chat them, I'll be um, consolidating them. And we can also uh, see if we can send out resources if we don't get a chance. The resources that address the questions if we don't get a chance to answer them. Um, really briefly, the California School-Based Health Plans, if you don't know us, we're a statewide nonprofit dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth um, by advancing health services in schools. And we do this in lots of ways, uh, capacity building, technical assistance, workshops and webinars like today. Um, and on our website, which is schoolhealthcenters.org, you can find all of our previous recordings and slides and a lot of tools and resources um, to help you serve adolescents and young people um, in school health work. Um, we do have the second part of this training, which is current trends in adolescent substance use um, next Monday at 1030. So if you haven't registered for that yet, you can do so on our website. Um, and our upcoming conference on November 2nd through 4th, which is virtual and very low cost. Um, again, again, a really big thank you to our co-sponsors, the California Alliance and the California School Nurses Organization. We're really excited to have folks um, from those two different stakeholder groups be joining us today. And now I'll pass it to Jim. Great, Amy, why don't you stop sharing your screen and they're perfect and then I will share mine. There we go. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Peck, as Amy mentioned. Uh, I'm a psychologist with the UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Programs. And this is gonna be a brief overview of SBIRT for adolescents. Uh, SBIRT standing for Screening Brief Intervention and Referral to Treatment. For those of you who would like a uh, one hour of continuing education today, please write down this start code somewhere because you'll be asked for it on the CE evaluation. So it's 1739. So go ahead and write that down somewhere if you'd like an hour of CE credit. Um, I'll leave that there for just another couple seconds. And then we'll move on. Okay, so what are we hoping to accomplish today? We're hoping that you will be able to identify a couple of components of the rationale for using SBIRT with adolescents uh, that you'll be able to apply to alcohol or drug screening instruments to detect substance use patterns among youth. 
that you'll recognize at least three of the motivational interviewing micro skills. We're going to do a brief overview of MI. And yet you'll be able to integrate at least two MI strategies into the brief negotiated interview, which is the brief intervention that we're going to work with uh, for reducing substance use among youth. Okay, so a little bit of background. Uh, in 2013, the, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommended that clinicians screen adults uh, for uh, alcohol misuse and provide those reporting risky or hazardous drinking with brief behavioral counseling interventions to reduce that alcohol misuse. About a year after that, some states like California determined that adolescent Medicaid recipients for us Medi-Cal uh, ages 11 to 17, should get an assessment annually in primary care settings using something called the CRAFT, uh, and where we'll, we, we're going to go over the CRAFT. Where this expert, uh, effort originated was with the American College of Surgeons Trauma Committee a number of years ago. They decided the trauma centers needed to be able to identify patients who are problem drinkers, uh, in both level one and two trauma centers. Uh, and that in level one trauma centers, they also needed to have the capability to provide an intervention for patients who are identified as problem drinkers. And the reason it started in trauma centers is because such a high percentage of cases coming into trauma centers are alcohol and drug related. As you know, I'm not gonna take a whole lot of time to go over this. There are a lot of medical consequences of substance misuse. Uh, it can lead to unintentional injuries and violence. It can make medical conditions worse. It can make psychiatric conditions worse. Uh, I work with that all the time in my patients who have co-occurring substance use and psychiatric or psychological conditions. Substance misuse can induce injury and illnesses, can result in infectious diseases uh, and other infections like HIV and hepatitis C. They can affect the efficacy of prescribed medications. Um, so if someone is taking a prescribed medication, they're also using alcohol or an illicit substance, it may affect the efficacy of the prescribed medication such that they would need to take more or less of the prescribed medication to get the same effect. The abuse of prescription medications is something we're gonna talk about today. The example that I'm gonna give you using the brief negotiated interview is of a youth abusing uh, Vicodin. Uh, substance misuse can also result in pregnant women in low birth weight, premature deliveries and developmental disorders. And misuse can result ultimately in what we used to call dependence. That term changed somewhat in the DSM-5. Uh, so we now talk about a, a moderate to severe substance use disorder. And those often require multiple treatment episodes. So substance use has a major impact on public health, both for adults and for youth. Why should we screen for underage drinking or drug use? Uh, one is that it's common, as you all know, I'm sure. It's risky, uh, it can result in unintentional injuries or deaths, suicidality, aggression and victimization infections, unintended pregnancies, academic and social problems, and increased risk for alcohol and drug problems later in life. We know that the earlier someone is when they start using alcohol or drugs, the more likely they are to have uh, an actual substance use disorder later in life. Substance use is also a marker for other unhealthy behaviors. So drinking, smoking tobacco, illicit or prescription drug use, and unprotected sex are all risk factors for the others. And substance use often goes undetected until it has more severe consequences. So we're trying to screen and catch folks before they get to the point where they're having those severe consequences. Why screen for youth opioid use in particular? This is a recent study just published a couple of years ago. Uh, they looked at over 3,000 3, high school students in LA County and they found that teens who use prescription opioids when they're younger, like ninth, 10th grade, are more likely to start using heroin by the time they graduate. So the study enrolled freshmen, followed them through their senior year of high school. It was a racially and ethnically diverse sample. 
I think it was about 50% uh, Hispanic Latino, about evenly divided between girls and boys. A couple of the other really interesting findings uh, with this study is that 35% of the kids surveyed in this study reported depressive symptoms. That's an enormous amount of depression. The uh, prevalence rate of depression in the general population is about 7% of the population experiences depression in any given year. So to have 35% of, of any type of sample reporting depressive symptoms is an enormous number. And 22% reported anxiety symptoms. Um, so now I'll back up for a second. So 70% of them, another enormous number, reported a family history of substance use. And that wasn't just the kids who were using substances themselves that was out of the entire sample, 70% of them reported a family history of substance use. And of the 3,000 students, uh, about 600 reported prescription opioid use. So that would be things like Vicodin. Um, and that's, so that's about 20% of the 3,000 high school students uh, were reporting use of Vicodin. Taken together, what these findings tell me is that kids are learning at a young age to self-medicate for anxiety and depressive symptoms with substances. Um, and that's not, not so great because if they're learning that young to cope with things like anxiety and depression by using substances, those patterns are likely to follow them into adulthood. Okay, so what is SBIRT? SBIRT is a comprehensive integrated public health approach to the delivery of early intervention and treatment both for individuals with substance use disorders, so with a diagnosable substance use disorder, as well as people at risk of developing those disorders. And, and that's the population we're really trying to catch in this process of SBIRT is catching people who are misusing substances but have not necessarily developed a full-blown substance use disorder just yet. Primary care centers, trauma centers, and school-based health programs provide opportunities for early intervention with at-risk substance users before they can experience more severe consequences. The goals of SBIRT are to increase access to care for people with substance use disorders and those at risk of developing them, foster more of a continuum of care by integrating prevention, intervention, and treatment services, and improve linkages between healthcare services like you folks uh, and alcohol and drug treatment services that actually provide specialty substance use disorder care. Key terms we're gonna look at screening is a very brief set of questions that identifies risk of substance related problems. Brief interventions are a brief counseling method that are designed to raise awareness of the risks of using substances and elevate someone's motivation toward acknowledge, acknowledging that there's a problem and that they may need to do something about it, may need to change their behavior. Brief treatment happens in some settings. Uh, it's usually brief cognitive behavioral work for a few sessions uh, with students who acknowledge risks and are actually seeking help. And then referral to care, procedures that will help students to access actual substance use disorder treatment. Brief interventions we know trigger change. Uh, a little counseling can lead to significant change. For instance, we, in some studies, they've shown that uh, a five-minute intervention has the same impact as a 20-minute intervention. So you don't need to spend an hour with someone, is the point, in order to have an impact. The research is less extensive for illicit drugs, but it is promising. Uh, that was with alcohol. For instance, cocaine and heroin users seen in primary care settings had a 50% higher chance of abstinence at the follow-up visit after receiving a brief intervention than those who didn't get a brief intervention. Um, yeah, brief treatment, Linda, I just saw your comment in the chat, is typically something that happens more in adult care settings. Um, it's not often seen in SBIRT with youth. You're absolutely right about that. Most school-based healthcare settings don't have the ability to provide brief treatment. What do we want to accomplish with uh, brief interventions? We ultimately want to bring about behavior change. Uh, there is, first needs to be an awareness that there's a problem. Sometimes we need to first work on that. Then we want to increase motivation. 
and then bring about that behavior change. A couple of ways that we can generate awareness that there might be a problem. Uh, the presenting problem, why are they there to see you today in the first place? If they're not there just for screening, if they're there for some other complaint, why are they there to see you? The other way to generate awareness that there might be a problem is through the results of the screeners that you're going to use. So in any given population, you've got a large group of folks down at the bottom of the pyramid who are non-users or low-risk users. You've got a group in the middle that we might term hazardous or harmful users, uh, but that haven't yet risen to the level of a diagnosable substance use disorder. And then you've got at the very top of the pyramid, the severe users uh, who probably do have a diagnosable substance use disorder. So what we're going to do in SBIRT with those hazardous and harmful users in the middle of the pyramid, we're going to do screening and a brief intervention. Uh, and with the severe problem users who probably have a diagnosable condition, we're going to do screening and brief intervention, but it's going to be oriented toward refer a referral to treatment. Uh, that's why the RT is highlighted there. Why screening and brief intervention? Substance use is a global public health issue. Uh, it's a prevalent worldwide associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And as with most things, the earlier we can identify the problem and intervene, uh, the better the results tend to be. Key to successful interventions. So brief interventions tend to be most successful when the clinicians relate the student's risky substance use to improvement in their overall health and well-being. So why are they here to see you today? As I said, if they're not there just for like an annual screening, what is it that, why is it that they're there to see you today? And if the extent to which you can draw a connection between their substance use and that condition, um, the more successful the brief intervention is likely to be. Some indications for screening uh, are when you're seeing students who you A, haven't seen before, B, uh, students who are likely to drink, for instance, students who smoke, uh, smoking makes drinking more likely. Those who have conditions that are associated with increased risk for substance use, like depression and anxiety that we mentioned earlier, or conduct problems. Uh, those who have health problems that might be alcohol or drug related, like accidents or injuries, sexually transmitted infections, unintended pregnancies, change, sudden changes in eating or sleeping patterns, GI disturbances or chronic pain um, are all health problems that might be alcohol or drug related or triggers for alcohol or drug use. And those who show substantial behavioral changes like increased oppositional uh, defiant behavior, sudden mood changes, loss of interest in activities, uh, a sudden drop in grades, a series of unexcused school absences, et cetera. So screening to identify students at risk. It's sometimes helpful to educate students about uh, what's considered lower risk drinking versus higher risk drinking in adults. Uh, and then they can apply that to themselves. So for adult men, this is from the National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse, uh, which is the NIH Institute that focuses on, on alcohol. And they did a study a number of years ago uh, showing that for adult men, uh, drinking no more than four drinks at a time or 14 drinks per week uh, is drinking less than that is considered lower risk. For adult women, it's no more than three drinks at a time or seven drinks per week. And for men and women over 65, it's no more than three drinks at a time or seven drinks per week. I, I believe they're reevaluating the adult men. Uh, guidelines right now because 14 drinks per week, I don't know about you guys, but that seems like an awful lot to me. Uh, so my sense is that, that that's probably going to be revised downward in the near future. It can also help to educate students on what we're considering a drink when we are measuring how many drinks they've had. So it's a 12 ounce beer, five ounce glass of wine, a uh, three and a half ounce glass of uh, fortified wine and a one and a half ounce shot of 80 proof liquor. So introducing this, how you introduce the screener um, is going to have an impact on the information that you receive from the student. So you might introduce it saying something like this. Uh, I'm gonna ask you some personal questions about alcohol and other drugs that we ask all of our students. 
Your responses will be confidential to the extent that you can say that. These questions help us to provide the best possible care. You don't have to answer them if you're uncomfortable with them. Uh, give them a choice about it. The two screeners that you're gonna be using uh, are the S2BI, which stands for Screening to Brief Intervention, and the CRAFT. And we know in research that's been done that students are more likely to provide honest answers if they are sitting down and filling out the screener themselves rather than if we are asking them questions and they're having to respond to somebody uh, face to face. So helpful to give them a paper version on a clipboard or if you have a, an electronic version that you can give them on a tablet, uh, can do it that way as well. The S2BI is the first piece of this. So you're gonna ask the student uh, or instruct them to do it if it's self-administered to complete the first three questions on the S2BI and you'll see what those are in just a second. If all three responses are never, you're gonna stop there. Uh, you're gonna provide some positive reinforcement like good for you, sounds like you're making healthy choices. If any response on those first three questions is uh, something other than never, then you're gonna have them answer the remaining questions and then follow the decision tree on the slide that's gonna come up after the next slide. So this is what the S2BI looks like. The following questions will ask about your use, if any, of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Please answer every question by checking the box next to your choice. So in the past year, how many times have you used and then tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana? The answers are never once or twice, monthly or weekly or more. So if all of those answers are never, you're gonna stop there. You're gonna have them stop there and just provide a little positive reinforcement. Okay, good, sounds like you're making healthy choices. If any of them are something other than never, then you're going to administer the rest of the questions. So in the past year, <clears throat> how many times have you used prescription drugs that were not prescribed for you, such as pain medications or Adderall, which is a common one? Uh, how many times have you used illegal drugs like cocaine or ecstasy? How many times have you used inhalants such as nitrous oxide? Uh, how many times have you used herbs or synthetic drugs like salvia, K2, or bath salts? Um, those are all synthetic uh, drugs that are meant to mimic something else. K2 is, and spice are sort of an uh, artificial cannabinoid, bath salts are more of a stimulant that are designed to be a sort of a low cost alternative to cocaine or methamphetamine. So you're gonna ask about the, those uh, other substances and then here's what you're going to do with it. So if the response on any of those questions was never, then there's no reported use, no risk. If they respond once or twice to any of those categories, then we're considering that's lower risk because that's Basically, they're saying that's once or twice in the past year. Um, monthly or more weekly or more is considered higher risk. Uh, and so the decision tree on the next slide is going to help you determine where to go with this. So no use, we'll just do a little positive reinforcement like we said, uh, once or twice in the past year We'll ask the follow-up as to BI questions and then provide maybe some brief advice, uh, maybe a little bit of, of education about whatever substance it is they're using. If they report monthly or weekly use, you're going to ask those follow-up questions on the S2BI, and then you're going to administer the craft as well. Once you've administered the craft, you're going to do a brief intervention where you assess for potential problems. You might ask permission, we'll talk about asking permission before we actually give advice, but giving some advice to reduce their use or quit altogether, and then make an action plan. If it's monthly use, we're gonna orient the brief intervention toward reducing their use and risky behaviors that might go along with that use. If they've reported weekly or greater use of a substance, we're going to orient the brief intervention toward referring to treatment. And then, so this part two is the CRAFT. So the CRAFT is a behavioral health screening tool for use with adolescents and young adults under the age of 21. It's recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Substance Abuse. It's six questions designed to screen adolescents for high-risk alcohol and other drug use disorders simultaneously. So it's 
evaluating for both alcohol and other drugs. It's short, it's and it's effective, it's been validated, and it's not necessarily designed to be diagnostic. It's designed to assess whether a longer conversation about the context of their use, the frequency of their use, and other risks and consequences of other of alcohol and other drug use is warranted. So do we need to have a longer conversation about what's going on with this particular person? There's the craft 2.0 similar to the original craft. This is the more recent version. It's validated for use with adolescents 12 to 18 years of, of age. The craft 2.0 screening tool begins with past 12 month frequency items. The original craft just asked yes or no, have you used these in the past 12 months? The craft 2.0 uses frequency uh, uh, questions rather than yes or no questions. That new set of frequency questions was tested in a recent study of about 700 adolescent primary care patients ages 12 to 18, and they found good sensitivity and specificity for detecting past 12-month use of any substance. That suggests better performance in identifying substance use compared to that of the yes or no questions that were used in the prior version of the craft. So the instructions on the craft, if the student answers zero to all the opening frequency of use questions, then we're gonna ask the car question only. You'll see what this means in a minute. If the student provided an answer that's more than zero to any of the frequency of use questions, then we're gonna ask the full set of six craft questions. Two or more yes responses to any of the craft questions indicates an elevated risk for a substance use disorder and a need for further assessment. That further assessment may include a follow-up visit with you and or a referral to substance use disorder treatment. <clears throat> so these first three questions on the craft uh, during the past 12 months on how many days, it used to say, did you or did you not? So it was a yes or no response. So now it says on how many days during the past 12 months, did you drink more than a few sips of beer, or wine, or any drink containing alcohol, use any marijuana, pot, weed, hash, or in foods, so edibles, uh, or synthetic marijuana like K2 or spice. Uh, how many days did you use anything else to get high, like other illegal drugs, prescription or over-the-counter medications, and things that you sniff or huff? If you put zero in all of those boxes, then we're going to answer the fourth question, and then we're going to stop there. If they put a one or more in any of those three questions, then we're going to administer all six of these questions from four to nine. Have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax, feel better about yourself, or fit in? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs while you're by yourself alone? Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? Do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? And have you ever gotten into trouble while you were using alcohol or drugs? Scoring, so scores range from zero to six. It's just yes or no. Yes is a yes response gets you one point. A no response is zero. Score of zero is no evidence of risk, obviously. Score of one or more is considered a positive screen, although a score of one is considered fairly low risk. Uh, but it does need indicate the need for just an additional conversation about the context of their use of any substance. So whatever questions they answered yes on, you probably want to ask a few clarifying questions to get a better sense of what they meant by that. The likelihood of having a diagnosable substance use disorder increases with the number of yes responses from zero through six such that by the time you have four yes responses, there's a 92% likelihood that they have a substance use disorder. And if they have five or six yes responses, it's virtually 100% certain that they have a diagnosable substance use disorder. As I said, uh, an answer of a score of one, about 32% chance that they have a substance use disorder. So you wouldn't necessarily, again, use this to be uh, diagnostic, but we would certainly, if the answers, if they have four or five or six yes responses, 
we would definitely consider that to be most likely this person has a substance use disorder and needs to be referred to treatment. I'm going to do a brief overview of motivational interviewing because it's the motivational interviewing skills are what are used in the brief interventions. And there's a couple different types of brief interventions. We're going to go over one called the brief negotiated interview. There's another one called the flow model, FLO. Uh, and um, which one you use is really up to you. Although what I'm going to show you is an example of a student using Vicodin. So MI, which probably many of you are familiar with by now, uh, was developed by Bill Miller at the University of New Mexico and Steve Rolnick in England uh, over the past 30 years now. In, their, in the most recent textbook on MI, they define MI this way. MI is designed to strengthen personal motivation for and commitment to a specific goal by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. A lot of important language in there. Strengthening personal motivation for implies that there is some level of motivation there if we can help the person to identify it and then to strengthen it. Making a commitment to a specific goal, so we're having a, a goal-focused conversation. Eliciting and exploring their own reasons for change. So rather than us lecturing them, uh, like what often happens in medical settings is, you know, don't you know how bad this is for you and what the consequences are likely to be if you continue this behavior, we're not going to do that. We're going to try to elicit from them their own reasons for change uh, within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. So the concept of motivation, we used to think about motivation as being more of a, a trait, like a personality trait. Um, traits are something that are fairly deeply ingrained and resistant to change. We used to think that people came into, uh, especially into treatment settings, either motivated or not. And if they weren't motivated, then there was not much we could do about it. Now we think about motivation as being more of a state rather than a trait. And a state can be modified. It's fluid. It changes over time. And so motivation can be influenced by our style of interacting with a person. So our task is to elicit and enhance motivation. This last bullet point on this slide is, is challenging for a number of people. Uh, lack of motivation, what we used to call lack of motivation, is a challenge for the clinician's therapeutic skills rather than a fault for which to blame our students. Um, that's not saying that someone's motivation is entirely our responsibility. It is saying that if someone is giving us responses that indicate that they don't have any motivation to make a change, is there, let me step back for a minute in the moment and take a look at my own way of being with this student and see, is, is there a different way of being that I can adopt that might elicit a different response? The underlying spirit of MI, four components of this, easy to remember the, by the acronym PACE, P-A-C-E. Uh, partnership, we're forming a partnership with the student uh, and identifying a problem to work on. Acceptance, we need to meet people where they are. Um, it's one of my favorite sayings is, uh, it's a paradox, but true nevertheless, that acceptance facilitates change. Compassion, we're genuinely caring about what's happening with this with this student and evocation we're evoking from them uh, their own values and goals as well as their own reasons for making a change there are also four processes in mi engaging focusing evoking and planning engaging is just we're engaging with the student we're building the therapeutic alliance we're building that relationship then we're going to focus the conversation on what, what is the problem. Let's identify the problem. Let's evoke, again, their own reasons why they might want to make a change, why this current behavior isn't working for them in some way. And then let's make a plan. Let's break down a larger goal into small bite-sized pieces that people can accomplish on a daily basis um, and ask them to agree to that plan. Again, we're not going to make the plan for them. We're going to make the plan with them uh, so that they are, so that we have buy-in from them. There are also four basic principles in MI, expressing empathy. So we're genuinely trying to just understand this person. We're listening for the purpose of understanding. 
rather than for most of us who went to school for some uh, healthcare profession or another, we were trained to listen for the purpose of, of diagnosing and fixing a problem, right? Um, so this type of listening is a little bit different. It's reflective listening. Um, and the idea is to develop empathy. I just trying to, I'm just trying to understand you and understand where you come from and understand the world through your eyes. We're trying to develop discrepancy between their more deeply held values and goals and their current behavior. So on one hand, you're telling me that you want to finish high school and go on to college. On the other hand, you're using methamphetamine several times a week. Help me make sense of that. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. We have to be very careful how we say something like that, because if there's a note of sarcasm in our voice, uh, we're going to be dead in the water. So we have to ask that with a sense of genuine curiosity. Rolling with resistance rather than confronting resistance, uh, which was in an older style technique that was used, uh, especially in residential substance use treatment settings. So we're going to roll with resistance. Okay, I can sure understand how it seems that way to you. Would it be okay with you if I share with you slightly different way of looking at the situation? Something along those lines. And supporting a sense of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is, do I, if I decide that I want to make this change, do I have the, the sense that I have the, the knowledge and skills and experience to be able to actually do so? Then there are four micro skills in MI. Open-ended questions are the first of those. I'm sure, assuming everybody probably knows what open-ended questions are. They're just questions that are hard to answer with just a simple yes or no. We're, they're questions that pull for a more descriptive response. We're trying to engage them in a conversation. They contain an element of surprise. We don't really know what the student is going to say to, in answer to our question. And they can be conversational door openers that encourage conversation. Affirmations is positive reinforcement. Has to be authentic. So it can't be sort of cheerleading. It needs to be an authentic, positive reinforcement for something that they've done or attempted to do. Uh, affirmations can support and promote confidence and self-efficacy. They can acknowledge a student's challenges. They can validate students' experiences and feelings. And reinforcing success with positive reinforcement reduces discouragement and hopelessness. Reflective listening is, is maybe the most critical uh, micro skill. So reflective listening, as I said, is what we really use to establish empathy. It's used to check out whether we are really understanding what the student is saying, whether we're understanding the meaning uh, behind just the words that are being spoken. Uh, we're using reflective listening to highlight the student's own motivation for change about their substance use. We may be gently steering the student towards a greater recognition of their problems and concerns. Although, again, we're not going to do that from a luxury sort of style. And we can reinforce statements that indicate that the student is thinking about change. In other words, change talk. Um, again, anything that suggests uh, that there is a desire to change, that there's a need to change, that there's a reason to change, or that they have the ability to make a change. And then summaries, which are sort of a collection uh, of reflections. You could think about it that way. Uh, that I think about it as I've listened to several verbal paragraphs, and I'm going to offer a few sentences back summarizing what I've heard. Um, and that's partly just so that they can hear it again from us. Um, people often come to an awareness or realization as they're talking themselves. They often sometimes come to a realization when they hear their own language being reflected back to them by someone else. We can use summaries to link subtopics within a conversation. Um, we can also use them to transition to the next topic. Okay, the brief negotiated interview, as I said, is one type of brief intervention. And here's what it looks like. Uh, so the steps we're going to follow, we're going to first focus on engaging the student in the conversation. Uh, we're going to introduce ourselves and ask permission to have the conversation. So it might sound something like this. Before we start, I'd like to know a little more about you. Would you mind telling me a little bit about yourself? What's a typical day like for you? How does alcohol or drugs fit into that? 
And what are the most important things in your life right now? Start to try to get a sense of what matters to this person. Then we're going to explore pros and cons using reflective listening. I'd like to understand more about your use of alcohol, marijuana, whatever it might be. What do you enjoy about it? What do you enjoy less about it? Or is there anything that you regret about your use of alcohol, marijuana, Vicodin, whatever it might be? If there are no cons that they can come up with, we might explore problems that were mentioned during the craft. So in other words, you mentioned that sometimes you get in trouble uh, with because of this substance use. Can you tell me a little bit more about that situation? What happens when you get in trouble? Who do you get in trouble with? Uh, and then summarize. So on one hand, you say you enjoy marijuana use because of these reasons. And on the other hand, you say that it's causing you some problems uh, at the same time. Feedback, we're going to ask permission, we're going to give some information, and then we're going to elicit a response from them. So I have some information about the guidelines for low-risk drinking. Would you mind if I shared them with you? Would it be okay if I share them with you? Important to ask that piece of asking for permission communicates respect for the student. We know that for adults, drinking more than or equal to four for female, five for male drinks in one sitting or more than seven drinks for females, 14 drinks for males in a week, and or use of illicit drugs can put you at risk for illness or injury, especially in combination with other drugs or medication. And if you have some sort of medical information, if, they, if they're there to see you for a medical condition, you might draw a connection between alcohol and drug use and that medical condition. What impact might it have on their medical condition? Can also lead to problems with the law or with relationships in your life. What are your thoughts about that? What do you think about that? Give them a chance to respond. Then we're going to use something that's called a readiness ruler um, to, to help me better understand how you feel about making a change in your use of marijuana, let's say. You might not actually show them a ruler. You might actually have a ruler on your desk and pull it out and say, so on a scale from one to 10, how ready are you to change any aspect related to your use of marijuana, let's say, in this case? Typically, responses on this readiness ruler range from four to six, so four, five, or six. We're going to reinforce that. That's great. It means you're 50% ready to make a change. And then we're going to ask, why did you choose that number and not a lower one, like a one or a two? What does that get them to think about? Get them to think about what are the reasons that make it important enough to give it a five, rather than saying, why didn't you give it a higher number? which would imply that it's not important enough to them. And we think it ought to be more important to them. So rather, which implies judgment. So great, it sounds like you have some reasons to make a change. Then we're gonna negotiate an action plan. We're gonna actually write that down. So what are you willing to do for now to be healthy and safe? Really important question. What would you like your life to look like down the road? Uh, depending on where they are in school, what grade they're in. You might talk about the next year. You might talk about after graduation. How does that change fit with where you see yourself in the future? And then explore some challenges. What might be some challenges to reaching that goal? We can then help them to uh, figure out some strategies to overcome those challenges. Drawing on past successes is also important. What have you planned or done in the past that you felt proud of? Who or what helped you to do that? How can you use that person, that method, again, to help you with the challenges of changing now? And then what are the benefits of change? If you were to make these changes, how would things in your life be better? And we're gonna summarize what we've heard and what we've talked about and thank them for being there. So let me summarize what we've been discussing and you let me know if there's anything that you'd like to add or change and put the action plan in front of them. Might present a list of resources. If you are referring them to treatment, um, then you might give them a list of resources in the community. Which of these services, if any, might you be, <clears throat> excuse me, interested in? So here's the action plan that we discussed along with your goals. This is really an agreement between you and yourself. Thanks so much for sharing with me today. You want them to feel like they can come back in and talk to you again if they want to. Okay, then we'll look at this 
with a team using Vicodin. Uh, to give you a little bit more of a specific example. So again, step one is engagement. What's a typical day like for you? And how does Vicodin fit into that day? What are the most important things in your life right now? I'd like to understand more about your use of Vicodin. What do you enjoy about it? What does it do for you? You're trying to under, get a sense of what purpose does it serve? What need does it fill for this person? And then what do you enjoy less about Vicodin or regret about your use of it? What's not so good about it? Uh, in motivational interviewing uses the term not so good. Uh, if they can't think of any cons, again, might explore the problems mentioned on the craft. So you said that you've gotten into trouble while using Vicodin. Tell me a little bit more about that. How, how has it gotten you into trouble? And then summarize again. So on one hand, you enjoy Vicodin because it does this for you helps you with your depression, let's say. And on the other hand, it's caused some problems that you mentioned as well. Give them feedback. Again, ask permission first. I have some information about the use of opioids by teens that I'd like to share with you. Would that be okay? We know that use of opioids by teens has some negative consequences. For one thing, it's very easy to become addicted to them to the point that you need them just to be able to function every day. That's important for people to understand. Uh, they can lead to short-term problems like impaired ability to learn, poor grades, and family relationship issues, along with overdose and death, and long-term consequences like collapsed veins, respiratory problems, and liver disease. Teens who use prescription opioids in their early teens are more likely to be using heroin by the time they graduate from high school. And because your brain is still developing, and this is a point we really need to make to teenagers, because your brain is still developing, opioids can cause changes in your brain that may be permanent and make you more vulnerable to addiction as an adult. What do you think about all that? Give them a little chance, time to process it, think about it, and respond to you. Again, using the readiness ruler, so to help me better understand how you feel about reducing or stopping your use of Vicodin, on a scale of one to 10, how ready would you say you are to change some aspect of your use of Vicodin. Not everybody is gonna say, I'm ready to stop using it, I'm ready to quit. Uh, some people will say, well, I don't wanna to have to give it up completely, but I probably need to cut down on it. Reinforce the positive changing. So great, so you, they set up five, let's say, it means you're 50% ready to make a change. Again, why did you choose that number and not a lower number like a one or a two? Let them respond and then reflect their response and say, so it sounds like you have some reasons to make a change. The negotiate an action plan. So what are you willing to do right now to be healthy and safe and write it down uh, with them? What would you like your life to look like down the road? Probing for some goals. How does this change with a Vicodin fit in with those goals? So again, trying to make that connection between their values and goals and their current behavior. What might be some challenges to accomplishing your goal with regard to Vicodin? Well, it's in the medicine ch chest because my medicine cabinet, because my, uh, my father has it for his chronic pain. That might make it more difficult. Um, explore the potential challenges and see if you can help them develop a strategy for uh, addressing those challenges. What's something you've accomplished in the past that you felt proud of? Who or what helped you to succeed in that? And how can you use that person or that method to help you with the challenges of making this change now. And then again, so if you make this change, how would things be better for you? Try to end up the conversation on the aspect of why things would be better if they were to stop or reduce using whatever it is that they're using. Summarize them, summarize them and then thank them again. So let me summarize what we've discussed. You let me know if there's anything you'd like to add or change and give them the opportunity to do that. Uh, if available, give them, again, if you're referring them to substance use treatment, give them a list of, of local resources that you know you should have figured out ahead of time. Um, hopefully you are aware of local resources that work with adolescents because not all substance use disorder treatment programs do, as you know. Uh, okay, here, here's the action plan that we've discussed. This is really an agreement between you and yourself and then thank them again for coming in today. So that's what the conversation would look like. And it doesn't have to take a long time to have this conversation. You can do this 
in about 10 minutes. Study that was published recently uh, with teens uh, looking at reasons that they stated for avoiding or cutting down their substance use. 60% of them said wanting to go to college. About half of them said worrying about parents or family reactions. A little less than half of them said, said wanting good or better health. And then some other responses were to avoid getting in trouble, to avoid getting addicted, to avoid negative cons consequences they've seen others experience and not wanting substances to interfere with extracurricular activities, including sports. Somewhere, again, this varies by location uh, and setting, but somewhere between five to, five to 10 percent of students screened will require referral to actual substance use evaluation and treatment. Student may be appropriate for referral to treatment when they report weekly or more use of a substance on the S2BI, or they score higher than two on the craft. So those higher risk students are gonna get a brief intervention. The brief intervention is gonna be oriented toward a referral to treatment. Or if they're not willing to engage in substance use treatment, say, okay, how about if you make a plan with me? Would you be willing to do that uh, to either cut down or stop your use? To the extent that we can, we wanna do a warm handoff. Uh, describe the treatment options to students based on available services in your community. Try to develop relationships between yourselves uh, where you're doing screening and local treatment centers and facilitate the, the handoff by calling to make an appointment for the student with the student in a private room with you if possible uh, at the time that you're doing it. Uh, provide directions and clinic hours to the student. Coordinate transportation if that's needed and if you're able to do that. Uh, and there might be some other useful referral strategies that you can think of. Some resources that can help you advocate for ESPERT. Uh, reference the endorsement of youth ESPERT by national organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Community Catalyst website has a lot of great resources, and there's a link there, and we'll get you a copy of the slides that have the links in them uh, following today's webinar. This is, uh, this is a couple more links, the Community Catalyst uh, website. Uh, providing evidence on the effectiveness of SBIRT is a document that you can access there. And Boston Children's Hospital has a great adolescent SBIRT toolkit that's very useful. Uh, the Hilton Foundation in conjunction with our group at UCLA uh, put together a website, uh, adolescentsubstanceuse.org. And the California School-Based School -based Health Alliance uh, has a series of quick guides on SBIRT, uh, one on screening, one on brief intervention, and one on referral to treatment that are also very helpful and, and provide detailed instructions uh, on how to proceed in each of those uh, components of SBIRT. Okay, that was a lot to get through in an hour. Um, we do have a few minutes left, uh, so I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you have uh, before we talk about the CE process. You can go ahead and put a question in the chat box if you'd like. Uh, Linda, okay, under q and I'm seeing you. You can do this in about 10 minutes, seems short. Is there any research on brief intervention methods used at school sites? Personally, I think the value of brief intervention is creating a positive relationship. Absolutely. We support a two meeting process so that at minimum, there's a chance for the student to build a relationship with the nurse or provider. Absolutely. I completely support that. Um, the first time that you meet with a student, it may be really just about creating the positive relationship. Uh, second time they come back in, now they've established a trusting relationship with you. They feel like they can talk with you. Uh, and you're probably going to be better able to get them to agree to setting a goal with you. Uh, let's see, I'm seeing in the chat box. Also, Linda asked this question earlier. This screen assumes that prescription drug use drug is only used among those who have used tobacco, alcohol, cannabis. Why is screening tool structured that way? Um, that's a very good question. Um, it's, I think in most of the research that's been done, Students, kids start with alcohol, cannabis, um, or tobacco, and then move on to prescription drugs. Obviously, that's not always the case. 
Um, and if you suspect that they are using, maybe using prescription drugs, you could ask that question anyway on the S2BI. Uh, Vanessa says, I'm curious about a referral process from the school administration to the SBHC. Do you have examples of this process? Tim, um, I can help with that one. Okay, great. Um, that the California School Based Health Alliance do have some examples about school based health centers and school administrators that are working well to have a non punitive approach to substance use. Like, even if students are caught using or um, with substances on campus, that they can refer to the behavioral health clinicians or the medical clinicians at the school based health center. So, we can send out some of those resources in the email that goes out today. Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. Uh, how do we address parental consent with the screening tool? That I think is going to depend on your particular school district and its administrative rules and regulations. Um, you want, if at all possible, you want it to be a confidential process. Um, however, if someone is using uh, alcohol or drugs, then you may want to have a conversation. Part of the conversation in the brief intervention with the student might be about, would it be okay if we talk with one of your parents or both of your parents about this? Um, it might be helpful to have them involved and try and, and, and engage them in a conversation about getting their parents involved. Sometimes they're not gonna to want to do that, obviously. Um, and the whether or not you have to inform the parents uh, again i think is is up to the individual school amy anything else you want to add to that um we there are also some laws around um california minor consent and confidentiality and we have a, a guide that's currently being revised um from the national center for youth law that we can send out as well about, I don't know that that one can go out today, but soon about um, when minors can and cannot consent to their own services around substance use without their parents' consent. However, as you said, Jim, it's always best practice to involve the parents if they can be supportive in the process. But if an adolescent says absolutely not, then sometimes the clinician does have some legal wiggle room to not do so. Great, thanks, Amy. Uh, and I'm seeing it's 1129, so I'm going to let Brandy talk to you a little bit about the evaluation and CE process. Awesome, thank you everyone. And we will get through this part quickly. Um, just a heads up, so I'm gonna post a link in the chat, which is the link to our GIPRA evaluation. And we hope everyone fills that out. Um, it's just a way to give your feedback and comment on the training. So please fill that out. And then if you do need CE credit for our session, at the end of the GIPRO evaluation will be a link to the CE evaluation. And that is where you will enter the start and end codes. Um, and we're also, Amy's gonna send out a follow-up email with all these instructions and the link. So I know we're, we have like one more minute. So if you need to hop off, don't worry, we'll send all those instructions to you. Um, and I'm going to post that link right now, and then we will also give you all the end code. So just as a another quick reminder, please, if everyone fill out this link, I'm going to post it right now. That's our evaluation. And then if you need CE credit at the final page, you'll see the link to um, complete the CE evaluation. The end code for our session is 1831. So again, the end code is 1831, and you'll just need the start and end code in the, the final step, which is the CE evaluation. Now, if you don't need CE credit, you just please fill out the GIPRA and be on with your day, and we will send everyone a certificate of attendance. So no matter what, you'll get something. So there's the GIPRA link. Um, and again, we will send out a, a detailed email with those instructions. And I'm going to post the start code, I'm sorry, the end code in the chat as well. All right. Great. And Brandy, Thanks, can I Brandy. Yeah. Oh, yes. And go ahead, Amy. Amy. Yeah, I was going to say, Amy, you can go ahead and share your last couple slides. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure people remember that we have a follow up to this training on Monday. Um, if you want to hear more from Jim, really helpful. This was a great presentation and we're really grateful to have you and come back on Monday to hear part two and then put November 2nd through 4th in your calendar for our virtual conference where there will be lots more great content around adolescent substance use. 
So thank you so much to our co-sponsors. Thank you to our funder. Thank you to UCLA ISAF and thank you to Jim. Thank you. Great being with you all today. Have a great day. Have a great day.